Detroit in the 1950s and 1960s, America's industrial heartland reaches an apex. Slowly, the wealth, prosperity, and job opportunities that existed in America's Rust Belt start drying up as American industry and manufacturing starts to fall behind the rest of the world. And as much of that manufacturing gets pushed overseas and the new Japanese economy is coming into place, pushing American auto industry to the side globally. <clears throat> no city faced the pressures of that change more than Detroit. The home of the auto industry since its inception, it had seen many successful companies rise and fall. Many successful automobiles hit the American landscape to tour from the Grand Canyon to the streets of New York City, from the maritime coasts of Maine and Massachusetts to the glorious coasts of California and Oregon. The auto industry set the average American free from the fetters of the nine to five routine that was this capitalist economy. Detroit flourished between the wars as manufacturing reached all time highs. Employment was everywhere to be had. Opportunity existed for all. And the great black migration from the South that happens between the wars, Detroit is one of the epicenters of that black migration. So much opportunity existed in Detroit for employment and self-improvement that next thing you know, black-owned businesses, black-owned neighborhoods, black-owned universities started to take shape. All of this pushed America into a new landscape. With the black rise of the black school systems and black universities and these black neighborhoods, came a new upwardly mobile black American musician. One that was willing to challenge the standards and norms of what had come before. One who was willing to initiate contact with not just the white American people, but with the rest of the world. The Detroit musician was a special breed, removed from the conflicts of the South the Jim Crow, the lynchings. Detroit was this land that brought innovation, not just to industry, but to social equality and the movement of the black people. This was reflected in the musicians that came from Detroit and a host of the stars of what became the 50s and 60s hard bop scenes and free jazz scenes were littered with the people that came from the great city of Detroit. Kenny Burrell, Tommy Flanagan, Paul Chambers, who was born in Pittsburgh but went to Detroit, the Jones brothers, Alvin, Thad, and Hank, and of course, young Youssef Latif. Latif was a different story. He wanted to make his mark and not just fit in and assimilate. He wanted his music to be different and he announced to the world that this new black America was here to stay. And we had a voice. And Youssef Latif introduces a new world sound to the music. A decade before the idea of world sound in the music would even be a concept. He introduces Middle Eastern instruments, Far Eastern instruments, Turkish instruments, African instruments, and in doing so announces to the European continent, the Far East, that the black American was a cosmopolitan person. He wasn't just limited to the black neighborhoods, barrios, and ghettos of the American fabric. No, this man was connected to his ancestry in the dark African continent the great migrations of the human experience, the literatures of the European tradition, the astronomy of the great Arab leaders. These were educated blacks. These were blacks that wanted to make a difference and wanted to not just be seen 
as second-class citizens, but to be recognized as the dawning of a new age for black America. So Detroit was this new urban American fabric at its best in the interwar years. And if you do the chronology of the jazz musician, you can really see that black migration take place. And the players of the 20s and 30s were almost all born in the South. And I think there's nothing that illustrates the black American experience quite as clearly as the few limited places, I'm speaking geographic locations, where you find the black community centered. And in the Old South, they were definitely spread across the rural plantations and the entire scope of the fabric of the South. But as that migration takes place, they're definitely herded by the American fabric and often by their own choice to follow their own community into the places where opportunity existed into a few small places. I mean, it's almost like apartheid in South Africa. There's pockets of black America isolated by oceans of white America. And those communities become very insular and develop their own sounds and personalities, colors and tastes, musical productions. Uh, they do interact because of families and relatives and uh, churches. There is, the, the music brings the various black neighborhoods to each other, but they're often separated by hundreds of miles of white gas station, uh, dust, dawn, don't go out after dark America. It's a scary place, even in the north. Detroit was this new, uh, fantastic opportunity. It was a place pulsing with energy and black educational opportunities. And the musician that comes up in Detroit has a much broader sense of his place in the world than the rural uh, blacks who were brought up in the South. And those blacks who were brought up in the South, their music reflects the blues and the church and a lesser educated experience. There's less composition, less ego, more just the expression of soul through improvisation in this great art form. It was with the ego of education and knowledge that the template really becomes broadened going into the 40s and the 50s. And a guy like Youssef Latif isn't a product of the South. He's not a product of that regional lack of global exposed rural cotton picker. He was a product of this new Detroit, this new cosmopolitan center that the blacks had a strong anchorage in. And I think it's a very important thing to understand because his music reflects this new globality all the time. He's always bringing in the global community, the global culture, uh, the acceptance of variance and difference, and not trying to just limit his experience to black America, but trying to connect with an entire human heritage, which is a very unique thing for jazz in that era. I think Ellington is kind of a precursor to that. Ellington's dealing with some global concepts in his music at times and continues to do so into the later years of his life. It's a very unique approach taken by a young Youssef Latif. And he has some great musicians that work with him. He's, of course, fairly entrenched in the Detroit scene for a while. Uh, he plays with the great Terry Pollard on piano for quite a long time, who's one of the great female musicians that's kind of forgotten for the most part in today's landscape. If you ever come across Terry Pollard's 10 inch on the Bethlehem label, that's just a great piece and it's pretty expensive. So if you find it for a good price, by all means, you should grab it. Uh, 
but he has this litany of great musicians and talent and thinkers. And the name of his first album, and a lot of these album titles even, reflect a new broader horizon for the dawning of the new black America. And it was no longer just appealing to the sensibilities of the white Americans in Tulsa and the white Americans in Atlanta and the white Americans in Chicago and Detroit. It was now saying, I think the rest of the world will enjoy what we have to offer and find value in this music. And of course, the tradition of going to Europe was already well in place. Coleman Hawkins, Ben Webster, uh, Cindy Bachet, for already decades, the black musician has been going to Europe to establish this himself and to find a new place in this world. And Youssef seems to find a way to bring the world to him in Detroit and eventually, of course, to uh, New York, where he moves in the late 50s. But it's a great story, Youssef, and it's a real connecting of the dots and it also kind of is a precursor to what comes from a Farrell Saunders and a John Coltrane in the later parts of the next decade the 60s when they start connecting those same dots and bringing in foreign sounds and eastern traditions and melodies and key changes that were foreign and instrumentation that was not no longer just limited to the scope of the American blues player or the marching instruments that we were traditionally seeing with the American and European traditions. So it's quite the journey a young Yusuf Latif takes us on. And today we're not going to focus on his whole body of work. It's an immense, immense uh, body of product that he produces. Uh, from Argo and Verve, kind of early on, here while he's at Savoy, which we're going to talk about today, he moves on to Prestige and New Jazz, where he makes some great records. Ends up at Impulse, where he makes six or seven great records. Then he goes to Atlantic, where he makes another string of great records. And it's just a really interesting time. And he's really ahead of the curve in a lot of ways. But what that also brings us is a guy that maybe struggled to find an audience at times because he was quite progressive, he was quite uh, spiritually advanced. And of course, he's part of that new black uh, Muslim tradition happening in America, the rise of the, the Muslim community and the new sensibility of the black independent spirit. And the Muslim faith was really giving credence to that black ideology. And so a lot of young black musicians and black artists were leaning towards uh, those Eastern philosophies and, of course, Middle Eastern philosophies if you're talking uh, Allah and Muslim, but it was still East from Detroit by a long mile. And we're going to look at what he does at Savoy here in 57, 58, and 59. And it's a prolific two years at Savoy for him, he makes a total of six and a half records, which is pretty incredible. Uh, working for Bob Weinstock of, out of Newark, New Jersey, uh, he, of course, gravitates onto Prestige New Jazz in like 58, 59. So there's kind of like a crossover simultaneous, whether the stuff he records in 59 for Savoy uh, was he already under contract to Prestige or was he kind of just doing one-off contract deals which some of these guys were doing to protect their own interests. Uh, a guy like Sonny Stitt never stayed with one label long. He often reappears at the same labels, but he's kind of just doing a record or two here, a record or two there. I'll come back over here, then I'll go there. And I think that might be the case somewhat with Youssef Latif. But what this also will kind of illustrate for us is where the label of Savoy was by 1957. Uh, Savoy, as I've said many times, was very rooted and anchored in the great 40s bebop movement. When Teddy Reed was at the label, they were producing some of the leading bebop artists of the time. And it's a pretty incredible legacy that uh, early Savoy recordings still offer us. But by the mid-50s, Savoy's kind of now behind the curve 
to some degree. They're not very often at the leading cutting edge. They're kind of following what's happening in the scene in New York, especially at Blue Note Prestige. Riverside's kind of coming online now with Thelonious Monk, Bill Evans, Cannonball Adderley, uh, who works a lot with Yusuf Latif, and they're part of a working group together for quite a long time in the early 60s. But Yusef uh, cuts an interesting pathway here in the late 50s at Savoy. And these are among some of the rarest records you'll find, not just in the Savoy canon, but in the late hard bop, modern jazz era of this music of the late 50s. These are tough records to find. Some of them have been reissued with varying degrees of success and opulence. Uh, some of these records are just about as rare as a three Sunday sunset. Like it's, there's some of them are just not easy to come by. <clears throat> they also come in very quick succession in the Savoy canon, which is a reflection of how little recording Savoy is actually doing at that point. And there's a lot of material that's coming out in that same era, 57, 58, 59, that Savoy is actually just buying up labels like Signal and uh, reissuing that stuff the Cecil Payne, the Duke Jordan stuff, uh, Hal Overton. That stuff's been reissued by Savoy, but not being recorded by Savoy. So Savoy sessions themselves are really thinning out. And you have some Curtis Fuller stuff happening at this time. And Fuller also is a Detroit guy who's been working with Yousef off and on in their groups. Uh, so it's interesting to see that Savoy is kind of thinning the ranks and doesn't have a lot of material coming out which makes these seven Savoy titles all in about a 30 LP range in the 12,100 sequence, which is, again, a fairly unique thing. You're not going to go to very many labels and find seven records by one artist over the course of 30 uh, numbers. So it's a pretty intense <clears throat> period for Yousef and Savoy's obviously giving him quite a bit of creative freedom and Savoy is doing some really good recordings between the region imprint and the Savoy imprint in 57, 58. But <clears throat> it's just not the volume of stuff that's happening at Prestige and at Riverside and especially at Bluno. Bluno is prolific in 57, 58. Just so many titles. So uh, Yusef at this point is introducing some interesting instruments to jazz, as I mentioned. I'm just going to read a few of them off here. Bamboo, bamboo flute, the shenai, a shofar, a zun, an argul, a koto. Uh, these are all, like I said, instruments not common to jazz or North American music in any way or in any kind of concept. Uh, he makes this as his first record as a leader in 1957. And this is a German repress from the European Union of jazz mood. Uh, you do see originals of this from time to time, but they're really never under three, four, five hundred dollars unless they're really beat up. <clears throat> and this was a, a sequence of really all the Savoy 12,100 sequence are tough to come by. It seems as though. The early 12,000 series in 55, 56 has far more pressings than what was happening by 57, 58, 59 in the 12,100 era. It just seems like these titles are just rare. Collectors maybe aren't giving them up as quickly as some of the early Coleman Hawkins, Lester Young, uh, Charlie Parker, 12-inch reissue stuff. But again, these are just tough records to come by on every level. And... Uh, this is this the group on here? Should, Ernie Farrell was on the bass on the Rabat. Hugh Lawson, another Detroit natives on the piano. Louis Hayes, another Detroit natives on the drums. And uh, the leader here, Yusef, is playing tenor flute, Argo, and something called the scraper, which I'm guessing is just a percussion sound thing, but I'm not even positive on that. Metaphor, Yusef's moods in the beginning. Uh, it's a great opener for a guy 
who's going to start making a large impact on the jazz landscape. Uh, he follows that up shortly after with his second release. And I think this one uh, <clears throat> just tells you a lot of what I was speaking about earlier, jazz for the thinker. And that first one was 12103. This one's 12109. This is, again, a reissue. It says printed in USA by SJ Records. Uh, I'd love to find an old copy of that someday. But again, I'm not going to shell out hundreds of dollars for it. And again, we have Curtis Fuller. It's kind of tough to make out their faces there. I think that's Fuller back there behind them. Hugh Lawson, Ernie Faro, and Louis Hayes. So it's, again, it's a quintet setting. Uh, just great, great stuff here. Happy Yology, O Blues, Midday Polarity, Space. So you're already starting to get some of those kind of mystical overtones here. Uh, a great session by a young thinker. And I think that's a statement of purpose, calling it music for thinkers. It's a, letting the world know that the black American is an illiterate being, a sentient, contemplative artist who wants to be recognized on a global scale for their contributions. I think it's a very important thing to grasp. There's sometimes you can almost get a broader audience to help people understand your plight and situation. I think sometimes the message of black America fell very much on deaf ears here in America. I think that's true in the R&B era. I think it's true in the blues era. I think it's true in the hip hop era. I think a lot of white America, in spite of glorifying black culture and clothing and style and the music and the sexuality of the music, there's still a denial of the black experience and a lot of kind of dismissing, well, if they don't want to go to jail, they shouldn't be criminal kind of mentality. And this is kind of, in a way, finding a European cultured society to recognize this contribution to black America, which he knows is happening when these artists go over there. It's validating what these black artists are doing. And I think that was a big part of what Yusef was trying to achieve is a connection to a broader global community. And once you're a part of that, how could white America reject us at that point? Little did he know. I mean, I think Coltrane takes some of that same quest upon himself. But I think white America has such a long way to go in terms of recognizing its own past and bearing the cloak of shame that this nation has to wear. We've committed some of the greatest crimes in history between the treating of the Native Americans here, which, of course, the Spanish, the British, the French, they were all equally culpable the Portuguese, you know, hundreds of millions of slaves were shipped across from Africa. Uh, the genocide of the natives and the slave trade are two of the greatest crimes in history. And we want to present ourselves as the presenters of freedom and justice and the policing of the free world, yet our legacy is cloaked in the blood and the shame of two of the greatest crimes of all time. And I think black America is more forgiving and tolerant of its own past and ready to move past it. And white America still hasn't even acknowledged it. And so you can forgive someone for doing you wrong, but if they are not even accepting that they did wrong, it leaves a real gap in that healing process. And you can try to put a bandaid on it all you want if they refuse to really treat the wound and acknowledge that there's a wound there, that wound will persist. And I think that's really what we're still seeing in America. And there's an incrimination of black America constantly happening in the media that keeps a fear and a disconnect in the average white American's concepts and viewpoints of the black American experience. And that fear and that trying to ridicule 
and reduce them to a bunch of criminals and half monsters, it prevents that healing and that accepting that the past that white America needs to do to move forward. Carrying guilt and shame is a heavy cross to bear. It's a heavy load. And I think that greed that drove that has condemned our children and our children's children to carry a shame and a guilt and a darkness that's coming off in these kids today as depression and anxiety and uncertainty and a lack of hope. Uh, the generation of kids today screaming out for uh, medication to keep me from killing myself. That's the darkness of the unforgiven sin that is our history. Uh, I think that stuff, I mean, I, it's a little philosophical and maybe uh, too spiritual, but I think there is strong links there. And <clears throat> again, the great crimes against blacks are committed by whites and th those same crimes don't happen the other direction. You don't hear of three black guys dragging a white guy behind a pickup truck to his death like happened to Robert Byrd in Texas back in the 90s. I mean, you, 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 you chained him to your truck and drug him to his death till his head came off. It's, uh, and two of those three were executed. The third got life in jail for being the one who came forward finally. But those type of crimes, they only happen the one way. And that's always been a puzzling thing to me. Why is there not the black retribution for what happened to them? Why are these acts of extreme violence and the lynchings and the burnings? And why is it always the whites persecuting the blacks still? And it's a deep question that's not easy to answer on the surface. It's something I've delved into in other episodes. But uh, it's still something that's fresh on the surface way more than it should be. This, of course, is a very nice old pressing of Prayer to the East. And this is probably my favorite, my favorite Savoy record. <clears throat> it's certainly my favorite Savoy album cover. This cover is a notch above most every Savoy album cover that exists. Uh, liner notes by Alan Stein. Album covers. Let's say album designs by Levy A Agency. Uh, Ozzy Cadena, Rudy Van Gelder. And of course, Rudy Van Gelder was doing Savoy. And if you listen to some of his uh, documentaries, he talks about how two days a week he was doing Blue Note, two days a week he was doing Prestige, he had Savoy on one or two days a week. So he's just doing all these leading New York labels. Uh, and I've often pondered and asked the question how he had so many of the black labels coming to him. And I think there was a certain amount of him being consistently available and never turning those black musicians away, which I've read over time happened when they tried to book other labels, other other recording studios. And so uh, part of the Van Gelder legacy and the monopoly he has on so many of these great recordings of this era, I think isn't just about how great an engineer he was. It wasn't about how available he was and how willing he was to work in very black urban settings uh, with nothing but black musicians and sidemen. I think that was something that was very unique to what Van Gelder offered. No judgment. Bring all your black musicians. We'll all record all of them. And remember, a lot of these labels by this time were very heavily uh, populated by the black musicians, especially Blue Note, you know. But even, you know, Savoy, who uh, was run by Herman Lubinsky, a known bigoted asshole, uh, he still had an incredible collection of black musicians under his tutelage. Uh, great album cover. Again, the same kind of band with Wilbur Harden now on trumpet. Hugh Lawson, Ernie Faro, and Oliver Jackson is now on the drums. Uh, some of the instruments on this are just fantastic. Prayer to the East, A Night in Tunisia, the Dizzy Gillespie song is just incredible on here. <clears throat> you hear an urgency and a desperation and a seeking earnestness in, in Yusuf Latif's horns, uh, whether it's the flute, whether it's the, the saxophone, whether it's any other instrument he, he happens to pick up. That is reminiscent of John Coltrane once again. I think he was a big influence on Coltrane on some level. Uh, just that integrity. And integrity for me is the ultimate reflection of how I feel about an artist. 
you know, that sincerity that drives great art. And I think Yusuf Latif is a high, high level of, of integrity. And this is one is 12-117. So, again, these records are coming out fast and furious. Uh, there is a bit of a time frame in there, but in terms of the chronology of the label, this, this is almost like a third of what Savoy is putting out over this two-year period. That's how sparse new recordings from Savoy had become by this point. And we're not too far away from the point where Savoy uh, moves on to just doing gospel recordings in 1960-61. But <clears throat> this one's 12-120. The last was 12-117. So we're talking a mere two releases later. Uh, this is Yusuf Latif, Jazz, and the Sounds of Nature. And there's some interesting sounds on this one again. You have tenor sax flute, Indian reed whistle, and tambourine. Uh, you have Wilbur Hard with the flugelhorn and the tambourine as well. You have Hugh Lawson playing the piano and the ocarina. Uh, Ernie Farrell's playing the bass and something called the earth board. And Oliver Jackson playing the, plays the drums and the Chinese gong. Uh, I've Got a Bad Man Ain't Good by Ellington's a really interesting take on that. 8540 12th Street is a song of Always Love, Song of Delilah. Has a wonderful lilting swing. Uh, he's always still rooted in the blues. He's never trying to make it about not being black music, which I think some of the later compositional guys do leave their black roots behind more. I think Yusuf's very rooted in black America, very rooted in Detroit and his upbringing and his friends that he grew up with. Uh, he's an ambassador for the black experience in America, and he's trying to cross-reference by bringing the world music into black America, not to take himself out of black America. That's a difference. And I feel like when you get some of those late 60s guys, even a guy like Herbie Hancock, I feel like some of his, sometimes his stuff is moving towards the white traditions. And uh, there's a separation, it feels like, from some of the black roots with some of those later com compositionally heavy guys. Cecil Taylor, another great example of a guy that feels very removed from black music by the time he's doing unit structures. This, on the other hand, is very rooted and connected to all of its roots. Uh, Saleb, I don't even know how you say that. That's another track of all of us that was wonderful and pulsing. Classical Savoy back, uh, simple you know, layout, the lines, the separations there. Uh, again, this is a nice original pressing of that. This record can go for hundreds of dollars all day long. 12, 120, The Sounds of Nature. Uh, I'm just a big fan of these records. Uh, that leaves us now to Stablemates. This was the last Savoy record I found from the first 150. I wanted to get that first 150 under my belt. And there's like about 30, 40 more titles now that come out after 150 that I have a sprinkling of. But this one took me a long time to track down. It's 12 115, so it's actually before Prayer from the East. And he only has one side of it. The other side of it is Chicago native uh, A.K. Salim, another Muslim convert who was bringing uh, his arrangements to the music. Salim's an interesting fellow once again. This is a European pressing, if I remember... Savoy, New Jersey. It definitely feels like a European pressing. The way that jacket's pressed over the top. Uh, it's got kind of the shiny. So I'm not exactly sure the origins of this. I got this record from South Africa. It took me a long time to track it down for a decent price. Because you don't want to spend too much on these records. Uh, the AK Salim sides are great. With, with the great Johnny Coles on trumpet. Uh, Kenny Burrell, Tommy Flanagan. Uh, Johnny Griffin on tenor, Buster Cooper, George Vivier, O.C. Johnson, and Howard Austin on the, on the baritone. Uh, of course, with the, the Yousef sides, we have Curtis Fuller, Hugh Lawson, Ernie Farrell, and Louis Hayes. So pretty much the same arrangement as those other early uh, Yousef records. A great cover as well. This is one of my other favorite Savoy covers, and boy, it just proved so elusive. And there was a few times I almost bought Japanese versions and would just miss them. They would go for like 27 on I'd bid like 26. So I never got too excited about it. And then those just dried up and I couldn't find those anywhere. 
This is probably my nicest, Yousef. This is 12139. This is a really nice copy of this record. The Dreamer, which again kind of uh, has a predilection towards spirituality and uh, the mystical side of life and the nature of life and death. He's always got some of that mysticism floating in his angel eyes and the dreamer. Frank Gantz now been added on the drums here. Bernard McKinney's on the euphonium. Uh, Terry Pollard's on the piano on this one. William Billy Austin's on the bass. It's still Ozzy Cadena, Rudy Van Gelder. Album photos by uh, Julius Fanta. Uh, fantastic. Again, just a real rare piece. Alan Stein does the commentary. A record that's going to put you back two, three hundred bucks easily. But uh, these, so there's a lot of the Savoy Canon that deserves more recognition and reissuing and being properly done. There's just not the audience, I guess, to do this stuff the way it needs to be done. This is what's known as an oxblood color pressing which makes it a second-generation pressing of the Fabric of Jazz, Yusuf Latif and his jazz quintet uh, from 12140, which puts it in like 58, 59. Uh, again, just a great group here with Pollard, McKinney, Austin, and Gant, the same as the last one. Stella by Starlight, Vals Bauk is fantastic, Moon Tree, Half Breed, and Poor Butterfly. Uh, it's just one of the great artists that's at this nexus, this crossroads of black America connected to the broader branches on the human tree beyond just the American diaspora. And the limitations of what America offered the black community it had gotten to a point post-war where that wasn't enough. We need more. We need more recognition. We need more freedom. And Yusuf Latif, the very nature of his uh, conversion to Islam, his global pulsings and leanings, it all speaks of this new upwardly mobile, jet set age African American who is going to be comfortable touring Morocco, Spain, the Far East, and bringing this music with him to the world to elevate not just himself and his own financial withstanding, but to elevate his people in the eyes of the world, the global community. It'll be harder to persecute us if all of America's trade partners see how beautiful we are as a people. We can't just be presented as former slaves and, and militant rogues and the, the riots in Watts and Los Angeles and Detroit and Newark. That's not how we want to be represented. We will rise up with militancy when forced. But even the Black Panthers are so misrepresented by the FBI and the American media. The soup kitchens, the book handouts, the educational processes that the Black Panthers were trying to enact. And we're willing to use force to push those agendas. And all they were portrayed as in the media by the FBI and how the overlying power structure wanted us to see them was nothing more than a black militia just short of being terrorists, which was very far from the truth. And it's also well known now at this point that most of the agents within the Black Panthers who were committing acts of violence were often undercover FBI agents trying to subvert the Black Panthers. That's how dark and deep this conspiracy goes. The subversion of the black people in this country is an all-out effort for centuries. And it's really hard to get a grasp on it. It's really hard to understand it. What is the benefit? What does the power structure have to gain? And of course, there's a quote that says, if you can convince the poorest white American that their plight is far greater than those of the black Americans, they'll never take time to realize how bad their own situations are. And it's an empirical behavior to have various tiers and strata in society and to keep your masses oppressed and limited 
with their opportunity, but they can also look down below them to see a class beneath them. And so they always remember that, well, at least thank God we're not them. And I'm, they're going to stay so worried about that group below them rising up and taking what they got that they will never rise up themselves and take more for themselves from who's above them. That's an empirical teaching that goes back to Sun Tzu and Hammurabi and how you occupy a people. You keep them divided. You keep them at each other's throats. And if you can keep your poor fighting the poor, they will never unify and rise up against the, the leaders and owners of the, of the day. And you can see that playing out still today in this American culture. And it's a great tragedy. So a little bit on Yusuf Atif, his fantastic body of work at Savoy that covers two years. And he's moving on now, recording for Prestige and Impulse in the 60s and Atlantic in the late 60s. All of it's great stuff. It really is. But one of the great social leaders that spoke largely through his art and his conversion to Islam, and of course the Nation of Islam in America at that point, does have a strong underpinning of freedom as part of its advertising. I mean, the things that Islam promised the black American were empowering. And that's why they were able to recruit so many black athletes, and Muhammad Ali, for example, into the ranks of the Nation of Islam. They offered more to black America than, black, than America did. And so it reveals a lot about the colors and the landscape of the country at that point. They weren't converting to Islam just purely for spiritual reasons. There were cultural uh, resistance, uh, financial considerations that Islam offered a better future to America. And, of course, that was also subverted by the power structure that exists in America still to this day. So again, if you appreciate this channel, please subscribe. That's always appreciated. I probably don't say that as often as I should. I try to say it every episode, but I, I, I forget a lot of times. Uh, if you want to support the channel, please go to my Patreon and pledge a few dollars a month to help out. Uh, my income's kind of low right now in between uh, my old jobs, DJing, and this coffee shop coming online in probably 60 days or so. We're hoping to be open. Uh, so anyone who wants to support or help the channel, pledge a few dollars. Uh, any way you want to help support is always appreciated. Uh, again, I want to thank you all who have supported and been a part of this channel and my Patreon for a long time. You guys are all invaluable to me. I appreciate all your comments and feedback. It's just a great community that I'm proud and honored to have been a part of. And uh, you guys are as equally important as what I have to say and offer. So you all be safe. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to y'all soon. Peace.